dramatic. Number of years in my previous life at the National Organization for Rare Disorders in my current life. And um, she invited me in January, very simple question, um, is a tyrosinemia story. So hereditary tyrosinemia is a very rare disease. And several years ago in my past life at Nord, um, a family, a woman contacted us and said, we don't have a patient group, but we really know that there needs to be um, research in this area. And so we don't want to form a patient group, but we want to do research. So Nord had a restricted research grant program. We said, all right, you raise the money. We'll put it in here. We'll figure out a way to do this. I didn't give it much thought. This woman was a powerhouse. Her daughter had the disease. She had the determination. So what she did is that she used her parents. Her dad was a professional magician. Her mom was a professional clown. And they went around in New Jersey in their community to every Knights of Columbus, you know, the, 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 the Chamber of Commerce, the, the, the Elks, the Lions, the Bears, the Tigers, whatever. They went everywhere and they began to raise money. And it was like coming in. And I was like, wow, they're really cool. But then she took it one step further. She worked for a national, a big corporation that had matching gifts. And she was smart enough to know that if she made a donation to any charitable organization, her company would match it dollar for dollar. And so she began to do this. And then she began to tell her friends. And her friends made donations to the fund that was being researched. And the company would match it. This went on for three years. There was over $10,000 that came through on matching funds alone, so much so that the company put a cap on their whole policy because she was like making them all crazy. And I always looked at her and said there was no patient organization involved with this, um, but there was a mom and a dad who wanted to make a difference in a very rare disease and get research out there, so they did what they could to do it. So. Someone's singing over here. So are they, are the slides going to come up? No? OK, great. I have notes over there. So the next thing that um, I need to talk about is that there are success stories in, from patient advocacy groups who have bonded together to make a difference. And so, yeah, that's it. It's, it's a PowerPoint on three slides. And so what ha, the beauty of having worked at the National Organization for Rare Disorders, thank you, is that I was there before the internet. So I started there in 1992 when, they, when we had to call. We all were on the phone with people getting information on rare diseases. We went, they said, we want XYZ disease. We go to the file, pick it out, make a photocopy, put in an envelope, stamp, and we send it out. It was very basic. But the National Organization for Rare Disorders came about because Abby Myers, as the mother of a child with Tourette syndrome, considered rare at the time, was, her son was in a clinical trial, but then was told midway the drug was working, everything was cool, then was told, nah, we're not going to do this anymore. It's not profitable. And she kind of went crazy, I mean, in a good way. Um, but what she did was to, she worked at the Tourette Syndrome Association part-time, and she contacted all of her friends at other rare disease groups, the Porphyria, the Wilson's Disease, the Marfan Foundation, the Huntington's Disease Foundation, um, neurofibromatosis, uh, cystinosis, all these organizations, and they got together and they realized if this happened to Tourette's, it could happen to us. Now, this is back in 1982, and if any of you remember the show Quincy, uh, Jack Klugman, he did a show. His brother had a rare cancer and saw this whole thing about the before the Orphan Drug Act. Well, long story short is that it was the power of these groups who were small, started by people who were closely related to the disease, who saw the need to do something. And so what they did was to band together, and they were able to put in motion, probably the most successful piece of health care legislation, which was the Orphan Drug Act. And the Orphan Drug Act of 1983 helped to spur 
the pharmaceutical and the biotech industry to take a look at orphan drugs, orphan diseases, 7,000 rare diseases, which has, let me tell you, it has almost doubled since I started in this, in this world. There are about 2,500 2, patient advocacy groups representing those 7,000 rare diseases internationally. Some are duplicates, but there are less than 500 approved treatments for rare diseases. But it was the orphan, at the time of the Orphan Drug Act being enacted, there were about 40. Okay, so it was the power of those organizations coming together to collaborate to start a movement that is, was really intense and well recognized and is standing today. The organization is over 30 years old and it's still standing. And it's that coming together it is the be and it is, that is the beginning and it is keeping together that keeps the momentum and it is working to take together that is success. And Nord is just one of the examples. I have colleagues and friends who are with the Gillian Barre Foundation and Sturge Weber and the Cardiofacio-Cutaneous Syndrome. And I can go on and on. And these were all groups that were started by individuals who saw that they were filling a void and that they were resolving inequities. And they were kind of like balancing the odds and they were providing hope. And it was, these groups are all still with us 25, 30 years later. Founders are retiring and making way for the next generation. And it was because they all saw a common, a common vision. I, I was really going to be kind of cute and have like all these quotes like thrown up here, you know? So I'm sorry, but I could do this, but it ain't going to work. So if I said to you that growth is never by mere chance. It is the result of forces working together. And that's James Cash Penny of J.C. Penny fame, right? And I, and I use that to introduce what I would talk about, about the ECD Global Alliance. As Kathy articulately shared the story here earlier about how it was very, very humble beginnings. And I met Kathy many years ago when I was still at Nord and we have remained friends and I've been her sounding board. She'd call me up and say, you got a few minutes? Can we chat? Okay. And I would graciously do that. But I have to tell you, if I step back and look at this from my rare disease scope, I am amazed, amazed at the progress that has been made over the past seven years for this organization. It, you have a group that has far surpassed goals that other rare disease groups that are maybe 15, 20 years in the making that are still hoping to achieve. And it is by the differences of how you came together. There have been some serendipitous moments um, that came along the way that just kind of fell into lap, that were opportunities that when it knocked, they answered the door. There were individuals who were on a mission. You know, for the Blues Brothers, or I'm on a mission from God. It was like that Blues Brothers philosophy that they had to do this, that they were driven to do this. And it was because there were people who were willing to step up and even to do a little. Even if it, I have been amazed at this meeting, and I've been to a lot of meetings, about the, ama the volunteers who are willing to come in and to help out with, to keep this going and to hold mics or to man the table or to make sure that people are here. It is just heartwarming, it's encouraging, and it's a good thing for this community to see that there's opportunities. And the one thing about ECD Global Alliance is that they were never afraid to ask for advice or to ask for help. They weren't bashful about it, and that's really good because in asking, you never know what the, what the answer will be. In my past life, I was a fundraiser and development person, which means that I begged for a living. God knows I did not ask God to make me a fundraiser when I woke up in the morning. It was the farthest thing 
from my mind. But somehow, while at Nord, I was asked to do this. So I'm kind of unorthodox. And so I always encourage people to ask. Because you never know. Sometimes, yeah, maybe they'll say no. But maybe they'll also say yes. So I always admire that in Kathy and the staff and the fellow board members that I've had the pleasure of getting to know over this past several months. And as you can see from this conference and from any other things, that this alliance cannot do anything without everybody. It's all hands on deck. It's everybody together. Even if you could just give a little bit of stuff, that's great because it's needed. Now the next quote that would be up there would say, I know there is strength in, di in the differences between us. We don't always get along with each other, right? I know there is comfort where we overlap. And that was from Annie de France. I don't know who she is, but I kind of like the quote. And I would follow that with a slide that began with, are you talking to me? That you would be saying, are you talking to me? I'm from Brooklyn. I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> so that's Robert De Niro, my bad impression. And yes, I'm talking to you. And you all came to this spot, this room, this place, on a different road. You each came differently. You took, some took three months, which I thought was amazing, to get a diagnosis. The average time to get a rare di diagnosis in a, for a rare disease is seven years. That has not changed in the 25 years that I've been in this space. So you all came from different places. You each have your own story to tell. Yesterday there were some fabulous stories, fabulous stories. And we were all moved by them. You may not always agree with one another. Hell, you know, sorry. Um, <laughs> yikes. Um, who does? It's no fun if we agree with everybody. But it allows us to grow. It allows those differences to overlap because we need to see other sides. You may find that you have an untapped ability to share or do something. Um, you may figure out that you're really good at coming up with ways to raise money or sell the t-shirts or I think I can write a blog or help you with your social media. Or you know, have you ever thought of doing that? It's, you may be able to find or we may be able to find untapped resources in the room that's here. The one thing that you have is a common goal. You want to improve the lives of yourself or your loved ones or your friends who have Erdheim Chester disease. That's your goal. And everyone in this room shares it or else you wouldn't be here. So your role in this, you come from different pathways, but you're going toward that same goal. And that's really important. So yes. Was this session designed to invite you to participate? Yes, it was. I was given the name of the title of the session, and they said, figure it out. But I do invite you because you don't want to stand on the sidelines of life, and you, you can help in some sort of way. And in doing so, we will learn from each other. So, the next cool slide that was going to be up there was going to be things to think about and things you're going to say, all right, Jean, you know, that's great. You know, how do we talk, how do we all work together? What can I do? And in the center, I had all these great little circles around here, and in the center it was to tell your story. People told their story here. Tell your story to your local newspaper, to the Kiwanis, to the Elks, the Lions, every opportunity you have with the blessings of the Global Alliance who can give you cues to share your story to raise awareness. Tell your story to your legislators on your state and local level. And when there's a call for action that comes on public policy, to respond to it and let them know, this is an issue that affects me and my family, is important to me, let me know. It makes a difference. 1983, Orphan Drug Act, that's what got that law passed. 
was a grassroots coalition. And I'm going to put a plug in that. I was just at a recent meeting for the Global Genes Organization, which is an, um, one of the umbrella groups for rare diseases. And they have a toolkit. And if you go to globalgenes, G-E-N-E-S, dot org, there's a bunch of toolkits. And they, I didn't get enough of these, but um, you should go on there and, and use some of their toolkits of telling your story. This was put together by individuals who run rare disease patient organizations. That's a good, helpful hint on how to do this. Another one of the, the circles would have been um, giving, giving a talent of yourself. Maybe you know, know social media. Maybe you know how to do some graphic design. When the call or the question or the ask comes from Global Genes, answer it. But, you know, nobody's asking you to sign on for your life, but just say, yeah, I can help out with that. Maybe you can do local awareness in your home community. Bake sales are still good. You know, you can still do those. Maybe there's a way to do some local fundraising and awareness in your area. Another one of the bullets would have said, maybe you want to be part of a committee. So when the alliance decides that it needs to have a committee for communication or for social media or for whatever, raise your hand. Say, yeah, okay, I'll be on the committee. If they're looking to expand the board of directors, you go, oh, that's big guns. Yeah, that's big stuff. Yeah, it is important stuff. It is big stuff. It does take a big commitment. But there needs to be a voice on the board from the community and from other individuals who can help. And maybe they're not affected by your time, Chester, but maybe they have an interest and they want to help with the cause. So you don't discount that. So maybe at your company where you work or your friends work or somebody works, they have a workplace campaign. You know, you, everybody hears about United Way. Those, that's a workplace campaign. I was on the board for a workplace campaign called America's Charities. And without having to sign up and go through the process of being anyone of belonging to each of those workplaces, if your company has a workplace campaign, you can write in. Erdheim Chester Global Alliance, because they will qualify to receive your, the, the monthly, weekly, however they do it. Same thing with matching gifts. If your company, somebody's company, a friend's company, anyone you know who is making a donation to this organization should check with their employer if they have, it's a painless way of doing it. Because they're eligible to receive those funds, and it's funds from somebody else's pocket naming some corporation. Same thing with in lieu of, or people would say in memory of, in honor of, those kind of gifts. If you cannot stand to get one more tie for Father's Day, tell your friends and family, I, make a donation in lieu of. You'd be surprised how that can become a habit with people. The next big slide was going to say, no one's going to fix the world for us, but working together, making use of technological innovations and human communications alike, we might just be able to fix it ourselves. And that was from Hamis Casillo. Somebody else I don't know, but I kind of like his quote. You look at me and say, so what does that mean? It means looking toward the future, looking at the present, looking at the future. Now, yesterday was a great day, uh, learning a lot about the scientific. I learned so much. Sister Immaculata back at Stella Morris High School would be thrilled that I'm learning so much biology, and I probably could have passed my regents with a better grade. But we learned about this possibilities in the drug development and the treatment development and what could be down the road and what are the things that we should be doing. And there was discussions about clinical trials and the importance of clinical trials. And what I want to do is add a little bit of glimmer of hope to Dr. Yanku's slides. I wanted to give it to him right away. It's to say when he gave the pros about being on clinical trials and then there were the cons and I was like cringing a little bit. But I knew that, that was, you had to talk about that. But I want to say that the FDA 
is now looking to the patient community, especially the rare disease patient community, to have more of a voice in how clinical trials should be designed. It, it, ten years ago, this never would have happened, but it's happening now. And so there is a way for the, for the ECD Global Alliance to be a part of the conversation when it's time to start designing clinical trials specifically for your disease, is that you can be at the table to help them say, that will work, this not so much. That really is key and important because it will allow there to be clinical trials that are manageable and will be able to be focused and will have everybody involved, not just people who are so far removed from the disease that they have no clue. But the patient group is coming up and you're coming together and that's unique and that's happening as we speak. We want you to be informed on what's going on. So if you're ever curious about, geez, what clinical trials are on Erdheim-Chester? If it's not on the website, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov. It's a government site that was set up to give you and will let you know what's out there. And you can get all this great information on it. And you can discuss this with your physician. If there's one thing that I saw from the presentations from yesterday and from today is that it's all about communication. And the information that you have gotten here will empower you to have that conversation, not just with the doctor who is an expert or key opinion leader, as I say, KOL, in, in this space, but with your primary doctor, with your dentist, with whoever, your chiropractor, whoever you have to go to, so that they can explain what's going on. And it gives you, I, I, I always say that it kind of like gives people a better posture to stand up straight and take a hold of their, their condition and say to their doctor, I just got this information and I really think it's important for you to know what's going on with me. And, you know, I'm giving this to you not just because I got it off the internet, but I got it through a, a reliable source whether it was the Alliance or I spoke to a doctor who works in this at a major medical center. So you want to be able to build the communication between your primary health care physicians and your, your, the guys who are at the center, the guys and gals who are at the centers of excellence who are working on this. If you're going to the NIH or if you're going to MD Anderson or Sloan Kettering and getting some work done, you want that information to also get in the hands of your primary care physician so that they know what's going on, so that the next time somebody walks in their office who has symptoms like you, they will shorten that time of diagnosis by saying, hey, this sounds like Erdheim Chester. That's what you want them to do. You want to pave the way for others, so you want to champion this. And you can do that by keeping informed, sharing it with your regular healthcare professionals, looking at clinical trials when they come down the road. We're going to keep our fingers crossed for those. And maybe raising your hand to become more involved or to understand what that process is so that you can make the best informed decision of what's best for you to do, okay? Also in looking toward the future, I know that Dr. Diamond has been holding some informal um, focus group, but it can be as simple as contact registry through the Alliance, looking and seeing what is being asked with its registry through the centers of, of care, centers of care. And it allows, registries are also important because it gives a natural history which is something that is lacking in all rare, most rare diseases, is to study the natural history of that. And it's the only way is to get the voice of the patient, the voice of the patient's family, into to say, this was my journey, this was my story, this is how I was diagnosed, I was misdiagnosed, these things need to be noted. We were talking yesterday, and Kathy shared a most incredible story, and it was how after Gary passed away, she sent his pathology reports to all the doctors that had misdiagnosed him with a kind note 
nothing nasty. And she said that three years later, she heard from one doctor who thanked her for that because it helped him diagnose another patient. Who knew? But I know that when my own husband was dealing with melanoma in New York and Danbury, Connecticut, and we were going to Sloan Kettering after a while, and Sloan wanted him to have radiation done, Danbury said, I don't know anything about this. This was back in 95, 96. We don't know anything about this. And Tom looked at him and said, well, then you better go to your medical library and learn about it because you're going to have to do it. And after three weeks of radiation, the doctor humbly came in and said, you were right, I apologize, I shouldn't have doubted you, or the center of excellence. So it was just that communication that needed to happen. And the patient registry is really important because it will spur the interest of scientists and researchers to come and do it. And your input is vital to having a natural history of this disease. It's not just for you, it's for your, your family, and it's for the community that you are making here today in Houston. Plus, it, it gives valuable information on rare diseases in general. And heaven knows, we always use some really good information on rare diseases. So the next slide was going to say, it's one of my favorite quotes, and I see it all the time in rare disease sessions. I almost want to say, hey, I had that first, but you know, you can't do that. So Margaret Mead is credited with saying this, and it really is true when it comes to the rare disease community. It's, she says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. I have seen it happen in the rare disease space where people have made quantum leaps within their disease. I have seen it with the Erdheim-Chester Disease Global Alliance in seven years, have the NIH looking at them, have pharmaceutical biotech companies kind of out on the peripheral edges looking because all the drugs, let's face it, they're off-label. They can't talk about them without getting their hands slapped at the FDA. So the fact that Memorial Sloan Kettering wants to do a registry, that you have a contact registry, that there are people who are willing to step up to the plate and help, I got to I'm telling you from the bottom of my heart, it is amazing to have seen this happen. So I encourage you to continue to be active. I applaud everyone here who's been here to share their story. And I want to thank you again for the opportunity uh, to be here and talk, even without the slides. Thank you.